Welcome to part three of our five part series on plantar fasciitis. In part three, we're gonna cover the most common treatments, some of their problems, and what is supported by research so you don't waste your time and money on ineffective treatments. If you haven't watched the first two parts of this series, we highly recommend you go and watch those first. Hey, it's Glenn here from Mehab, the world's leading physical therapy alternative, where we educate and empower you to take control of your recovery. If you're new here, make sure you click that subscribe button and all the links we mentioned in the video can be found in the description below. As always, this information is meant for educational and demonstration purposes only. With that out of the way, let's get into it. There are so many people telling you how to treat plantar fasciitis, it can be hard to figure out what works and what's just snake oil. Unfortunately, in an attempt to recover quickly, people try anything and everything. With anyone swearing that their technique or product fixes plantar fasciitis, they're going to give it a try. Trying multiple treatments at once is a problem in itself, whether it's evidence-based or not, as it provides no clarity on the effectiveness of any particular treatment. If you do five things and get worse, what made you worse? There is no way to know. The more interventions you have, the muddy the waters become, making it impossible to actually understand how your body is reacting. Part of the problem is, as we mentioned earlier, diagnostic testing is flawed. Combine that with the multifactorial causes of plantar fasciitis and the thousands of fixes available, it is no wonder people are confused about what to do. After going over the current treatment options, I'm going to tell you what I believe is a commonly overlooked cause of plantar foot pain, and what you should be doing to help fix it. Calf stretches. One of the most commonly prescribed treatments for plantar fasciitis are calf stretches, but its recommendation doesn't really fit. The premise behind calf stretching is that the plantar fascia and the Achilles tendon are connected, when in reality they are very rarely in direct contact, especially in adults. They do both attach to the periosteum, which is a connective tissue layer that covers bone, but that's about as close as they get. The relationship between them is that increased load on the Achilles tendon also increases load on the plantar fascia. An example is standing on the entire foot versus standing on your tiptoes. When standing on your foot, there is minimal tension on the Achilles tendon and some on the plantar fascia. Standing on your tiptoes increases Achilles tendon and plantar fascia load. The plantar fascia is under the most tensile load when the toes are extended as occurs with the push-off phase of walking or running. As mentioned in part one, stretching is another one of those subjects buried in misconceptions, the biggest being that it lengthens tissue. This belief has been debunked, and while there is a temporary increase in tissue length during stretching, it returns to its normal position shortly after. Stretching has been shown to decrease the stiffness of muscles and tendons for a brief period of time. But the main mechanism for flexibility increases is an improved tolerance to the discomfort of stretching. This is why under anesthesia, joints have full range of motion, as the protective mechanism for overstretching is turned off. Icing is fine if you like to do it, but it doesn't actually fix anything and has no negative or positive effects on recovery. What it can do is temporarily decrease your symptoms, which is both positive and negative. While it can help make weight bearing tasks more tolerable due to its numbing effect, it can lead to overdoing it and causing injury and prolonging recovery. Pain mitigation. This part is purely our opinion. We recommend that you always follow your physician's instructions regarding pain relievers. The problem with pain relievers is much like icing, they alter your ability to detect if too much stress is being placed on the healing structures. This can result in injury which starts the entire healing process over again. It would be similar to having your car engine start grinding while you're driving and just turning up the radio so you can't hear it. Just because you can no longer detect it, it doesn't mean that it's fixed and you're probably causing more damage. Plantar fascia stretching. The plantar fascia is an incredibly strong fibrous tissue designed to support our entire body weight. Performing plantar fascia stretches in non-weight bearing will have little to no impact on it. The tensile load applied from this form of stretching typically does not have enough force to alter anything that just wiggling your toes wouldn't do. What it might do is provide some desensitization to the pain or prepare the foot for bearing weight. But that's a big mite. Another point of confusion is that they say plantar fasciitis is caused by overstretching. But now stretching fixes it. Well, which is it? Does it cause it or does it fix it? Massage, trigger point release, soft tissue mobilization. Pressing, pushing, or prodding in a normal foot can be painful in itself as we talked about in the diagnostics portion of the series. And having soft tissue work by your therapist can provoke pain that they can attribute to plantar fasciitis. Palpation and its use for the assessment of taut bands, adhesions, and trigger points 
is essentially disproven and is one of the lowest forms of assessment. While there are benefits to therapeutic touch, there is no significant evidence for these interventions being effective for plantar fasciitis, especially over exercise alone. Any claims are mostly anecdotal. If anything, it could help desensitize structures in those with chronic plantar fasciitis. But desensitization takes months of consistent daily stimulation to occur. Let me be clear. In no way do these things release adhesions, break up trigger points, or break down scar tissue, despite what practitioners may claim. Therapeutic ultrasound. Despite the abundance of evidence against the efficacy of therapeutic ultrasound, it continues to be used expansively in the physical therapy world. As is with other conditions, therapeutic ultrasound has shown no benefit to plantar fasciitis. Extracorporeal shockwave therapy. The quality of evidence for or against shockwave therapy is not great. Several studies have shown it to be no better than placebo, while others have shown some improvement. The use of shockwave therapy currently lacks the quality and consistency to support its unconditional use. The research is clear that it should be considered as a last-ditch conservative option, especially as it is expensive and not covered by insurance, and how painful it is. It could be used for those that have failed to respond to appropriate conservative care within six months. Injections. Some research has shown short-term benefit for symptoms within one month of onset. However, long-term outcomes are the same whether you have an injection or not. If cortisone is stacked with a numbing agent such as lidocaine, which dulls the ability to detect pain, some initial symptom relief could be attributed to that. There are a few risks reported with injections, including a risk of rupturing the fascia or fat pad atrophy, with increasing risk with repeated injections. Remember, symptom relief beyond one month has not been demonstrated in research. Orthotics. The jury is out on orthotic use. Often recommended with the intention of correcting pronation, as reported in our other videos, the claim of pronation as a contributor to plantar fasciitis is untrue. What the research does show is that custom orthotics have no measurable benefit over prefabricated orthoses and that prefabricated, aka store-bought inserts, may even be better as they provide superior cushioning over rigid plastic custom orthoses. Night splints. Again, the jury is out on night splints. While some studies have reported benefit, others have reported no difference if they're used or not. With the plantar fascia and the plantar intrinsic muscles being multi-joint structures, if actually effective, splints would require extension of the toes as well as dorsiflexion of the ankle to place stretch on the structures. But again, my question goes back to the claim that overstretching causes plantar fasciitis. Well, which is it? Does stretching cause it or fix it? Following that logic, it's like saying fire burns the skin, but more fire will fix it. It just doesn't make any sense. Surgery. There is a lack of high quality evidence to support surgical interventions. Common procedures are release of the plantar fascia or neurolysis, the destroying of plantar nerves. A large cohort study indicated that 70% of patients showed improvement following surgery, but only 50% of patients had complete satisfaction. Additionally, there are consequences for the complete division of the plantar fascia, including getting flat feet, bunions, and hammer toes, which all require the use of orthotics for the rest of your life. None of these treatments seem to be the magic fix for plantar fasciitis. Even the most commonly recommended treatments have relatively poor research to support their use it's pretty clear that something has been missed. If the cause of plantar fasciitis was actually damage to the plantar fascia, the treatments mentioned above would in theory be appropriate. But it seems that one of two things have happened. Either the best treatment options have not been discovered yet and we are way off the mark, or we're misdiagnosing the root cause of plantar fasciitis and trying to treat it with the wrong things. I believe that it's going to be the latter. In the next video, we're going to reveal what we think plantar fasciitis actually is and why. So make sure you don't miss that by clicking the subscribe button and the notification bell. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on the next one.